rotate the points and we want to move them so that they're not through the property line. So the default setting for the style you've got right now uh, looks like this. So after assignment three, you probably would have done this exercise. Let me turn off the design that we did yesterday. Okay, so this is on a different layer. Okay. So when you had the front elevation and the back elevation, uh, the elevations from the back, different different uh, layer, different uh, um, uh, description. So they're in a different group. And then this is on a different layer, different description, different group. Uh, but the default for the style is this uh, horizontal to the x-axis view. So one of the things you were supposed to do in the assignment uh, was to um, click on one, go into the grip, rotate label and marker, and then you can snap to a near point, uh, a near point onto the property line, and now it's parallel to the property line. And you can do the same with the back. So this is one of the things I showed you how to do. So there you go. And then you don't want to see the, uh, the text through the line. So you could grab the point and then not the actual marker, but the label grip. And then you can bring it up and you can do the same thing here. And you have that look. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the look we're going for, at least for the front and the back. You may have to make other adjustments as uh, more uh, points appear like when we do our design, those yellow points that I turned off. Um, when it comes to, uh, doing this adjustment, there's two things you can do to make that drafting exercise uh, a little faster. Uh, and again, don't do any of this. Don't worry about making the points rotated and looking good until all the design is available. Okay? I'm just showing you this now so that when you're ready, uh, usually you want to kind of stick to one task at a time. So I would do your grading on mass through the entire site, and then you can go back and uh, fix all of the presentation for it. Okay, so let me undo these steps. And again, I wouldn't waste your time doing this until the design is ready. Okay, so don't 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 design and then draft and design and then draft and design and then draft for presentation. Just do all your design at once. That's the, the, the biggest part of the ass assignment. And then you can go back and do all your uh, adjustments. So here's one tip or trick you can use. If you list one of your lot lines, not only do you get the length of the lot line, but you also get if it's a line, this is a polyline, but if you explode them, if you explode these polylines and make them just lines, let me do that. If you list the line, it's going to give you the length of the line, and it's also going to give you the angle in the XY plane, which is like the bearing, the direction of the line. So if 19048 uh, is the same for most of these, 1948, 198. Or eight, you'll see they're all parallel. So in this example, these lines are all parallel. And you will see in the subdivision, not all the lines are parallel, but there may be two, three, four, five, six, ten that are parallel. So they have a common rotation angle. So once you recognize that, you can do this. You can rotate one point. So I'm going to click on this, go into here, rotate, and I'm going to snap to the node. And then when I list this point, It'll tell me the rotation angle. Okay, this is in uh, I forget if it's in degrees. Okay, so D for degrees. You can list the point, and it'll tell you the rotation angle for the marker and label. Or you can go to your uh, points, uh, your properties, and when you click on it, it'll populate the properties. And down at the bottom, you'll see again. Whoops, not the bottom. Where is it? Uh, the point. Sorry. You will see at the bottom the rotation angle for both the label and the marker. So these two here, one, two. Okay. So this is what I do. If I want to rotate them, once I rotate one, I'll go into the point, I'll click on it, I'll copy this, control C, copy that into memory, and then I can pick all the other points I know that are going to be parallel. Okay. Not the entire site, only the ones that have the parallel line. And then if you go into the label property, you can paste Control V and paste Control V, and now have the, they all have the same location. And you can do it with the back as well. So grab all of these. I know that they're parallel. So once you rotate one, and you know others have the same rotation, you can click in here, paste, click in here, paste, and now they all have the same rotation. So that's a quick way of rotating a whole bunch of points that have the same rotation angle for the marker and for the label. Okay, so that's that's one quick tip and trick. So when you're doing your subdivision, when you recognize there's a bunch of parallel lot lines, rotate one point, 
and then copy and paste the rotation angle of the one you adjusted to the others. Okay? And you can do it through the properties uh, dialog box here. So that's an AutoCAD kind of tip. The other thing you can do, right, so now we need to grab this point and drag it so that it's not through the line, so that it's legible. Okay? So now I'm going to take advantage of the style. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to go into my uh, tool space. And I'm going to look at my points, uh, sorry, my settings under points and my point label styles. So the style for this is called uh, elevation. Right? So if I, if I go to the group settings for this, point group, the style is called elevation. And I'm just going to do a, a quick sketch uh, here. So can everybody see my hand here? I'm going to draw something on whiteboard. Can you see my hand? Give me a yes in the chat, please. Okay, so here's what I'm going to tap into. We have the marker, and we have the label. I'm just going to type in the word elevation, the number, right? There's a marker and a label. On each of those features, the marker and the label, there are nine reference points. There's one middle center, middle right, middle left. There's one top center, top right, top left, and there's bottom center, top right, top left. And then on the elevation, you have the same reference points, middle center, right center, left center, top center, right top, left top, bottom center, bottom right, bottom left. Okay? So these are the two different things. This is the marker and this is the label. Okay? So what we can do is we can place we can place the elevation label. We can pick the reference point for the label and we can pick the reference point for the marker. So what it looks like now is that the label, let me do this in a different color. The the elevation is using this reference point, which is the middle left, and it's connecting to the middle right of the object marker. Okay, so this is connected to this. That's what it looks like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redefine it. I'm going to say, don't use this one, use this one. Connect this point to this point. That's the reference I want. And then it'll appear as if the elevation is higher, relatively speaking. So you can play with how these points, how these objects are related, or how these uh, these uh, different labels and markers are related. And if you do that, then you can get a quick effect that you can avoid manually uh, setting up. Okay? So I'm just trying to, there's many things you can do with styles and marker styles and label styles, but this is one of the tricks you can use to get it off of the uh, standard kind of position. So let's take a look at that. Any questions about that? Does everybody understand what I'm about to do? And what that's going to do to the draft, right? So if I if I put the label reference point to the bottom instead of the middle, then you can play around with how uh, how the appearance is going to be in a relative way. Okay. So let me show you what that looks like. So I want to go to uh, the elevation style edit, and when we go to the layout, I want to look at the elevation lay label. So the anchor component, the anchor component is the middle right. The middle right is this thing right here. The middle right of the marker. So I'm going to leave that alone. And then what we're going to look at is you'll see here the text is actually using the middle left to connect. Instead of the middle left, which again is this point here, I'm going to use the bottom left. So I'm going to change this to bottom left. Okay, and watch the preview off to the side. Bottom left. Right, so it pushes it up. Right, so now the bottom left of the text is connected to the middle right of the marker. And when you say apply and you say OK, watch what happens to the drawing. It pushes it up. Okay, so now I've unmasked by changing the style of the group, I've drafted everything and everything is the, relatively speaking in the exact same position. So now I don't have to individually change one at a time. I can do the same for this label as well, right? 
So I could take this one, and instead of putting it outside, and you can play with this in so many ways. If I'm going to go to this one, edit, I'm actually going to take, and I'm going to go back to this, I'm actually going to force instead of, instead of this point and this point, which is the current default setting, I'm going to use this marker, I'm going to use this one, and I'm going to connect to that with this piece here. So I want this this part of the label to connect to this part of the marker. And watch the effect I get. So this on the marker is the middle left, and on the label is the bottom right. Middle left, bottom right. So this is going to be the middle left, and then I'm going to use the bottom right. So now it appears on the left side and above again, so I can say OK. And you can see now it's drafted to the inside and above the line. And I get that effect throughout. Okay. Now, the rotation angle, you may have to play with, right? If the lines are not parallel, then there's nothing, you know, you're going to have to individually do it. So if you have a bunch of uh, property lines that are kind of radial, so if you draw lines that look like this, oops, uh, set current. If you have a bunch of property lines that are kind of radial, you need to rotate those individually. But as soon as you kind of get to a spot where you've got a bunch of parallel lines, then those rotation angles can all be the same. And if you change your style, then you can avoid the grip edit. Remember when you had to touch it and, and, and move it up, and then touch it and move it up or down, then you can quickly adjust for those. So again, I'm just I'm not giving you all, you know all the possible scenarios, but I'm just opening your eyes to the possibilities. There's a lot of things you can do with the style to make the drafting go a lot easier. Okay. Uh, does everybody agree that this tip and trick would have been useful when you did the uh, assignment three, when I asked you to rotate the points? Do you see the power in this? Does everybody understand the advantage of doing this? I hope. Okay. Usually when I do this in class, I get a lot of ooh and ah, and why didn't you teach us that before? Um, the focus before was the design. Now we're getting into the presentation and the drafting. Okay, so these are just some simple tips and tricks. And at the end of the day, one of the things I'd like to stress to students, and this is just some advice, um, when you're creating these drawings, um, what's going to be most important when you get out of school is if you're going to have a portfolio of drawings or a portfolio set of, uh, uh, of drawings, uh, they have to look good. When you go to an interview or when you're, you know, whether it be in person or uh, virtual these days, um, you're going to show the work. And as soon as you unroll or open up a PDF to show somebody what you, the work you've done, in the short time you're going to be uh, discussing the work that you, you've done, uh, in Seneca, maybe in this course or others, the presentation is going to be front and center. As soon as you unroll or open the PDF and you look at it, you can immediately tell whether the person uh, who, who is seeing it for the first time is impressed or not. Does it look good or doesn't it? There's not a lot of time during an interview to check that the design is perfect or that there's no errors. But at a glance, you can tell whether it looks good or not. So if you take the time with the presentation, uh, you, can, you can really go a long way to impress somebody. Okay? The design doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be complete sometimes. But as long as you have something that's shown that looks like you've taken the time to really present it in a professional way, uh, it's going to go a long way. Right? You can impress them with that very quickly. The details of the design, it's hard to kind of determine whether everything is right or not, or whether there's any mistakes or errors or omissions. But certainly, you know, the, the, the presentation is the thing that goes a long way. So that's just some advice I'm giving. So when you look at this drawing, you know, it may seem like a very, uh, a very strict thing that I'm doing. Everything is parallel. They all have the same angle. Good. The adjustment above the line to the right or above the line to the left is exact. Okay, I'm not I'm not doing this by eye, right? I'm not. Uh, let me bring back the other points that I did yesterday. So if we look at uh, the layer that I created yesterday, Gen. So here's all the design I did yesterday. So again, if I want to rotate those points, I could borrow from this, right? They're parallel. So I could borrow from this one here, this uh, rotation angle. Control C for copy. And then I could make all of these the same, just at a glance. And I won't do all of them, but I'll do some. 
uh, and then if I paste it in here, I paste it in here, you'll see now they're all parallel. Oops, cancel. You'll see they're all parallel. Now, when you see this overlap, see this thing here? Well, that's maybe where you want to rotate one of them, not parallel to the line, but perpendicular to the line. So, you know, at a glance, it looks like it's parallel to the line. In reality, it's exactly in line. They're all the same rotation. Um, if you tried to do that by eye, it would take longer and it would be a, a lot messier. So, you know, if I go into here, if I want to rotate each one, if I, uh, if I rotate, if I just do this by eye, and I rotate this one by eye, Oops, rotate this one by I, sorry, rotate by I, rotate by I. You know, if you, if you do one at a time, first of all, it takes longer. And if it's not exactly parallel, you can almost see the problem as, as you go through. So if it looks like it's supposed to be parallel, make sure it's exactly parallel. If it looks like it's supposed to be perpendicular at 90 degrees, make it exactly perpendicular at 90 degrees. Uh, so that, that's my recommendation to you as far as presentation is concerned. So let me get the rest of these and I'll show you a couple more tips. So let's make all of these parallel. So paste here and here. So now they're all parallel. To take care of the overlap, what I did here, and I'm just going to put in some reference line. I'm going to offset 8 meters to the front of the house and 12 meters to the back of the house. So typically what I do, if you remember what this stuff represents, this is the top of slope. Between here and here, this is a 3 to 1 slope. So what I like to do is I rotate the point that represent the top of slope. Right? So in the backyard as well, right? This is the top of slope. This is the bottom of slope. This is the top of slope. This is the bottom of slope. So I like to rotate the top of slope. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to rotate. And I'm going to go perpendicular to the next lot line. Right? So that overlaps as well. So that may or may not be a problem. You might have to fix that. Or you can rotate it the other way. Right? Go 90 degrees the other way. So take this and make it parallel. Uh, parallel in the other direction, rotate, label, and marker, All right, we could make it parallel this way, so it's not in the way, that's another way of doing it, uh, so this rotation angle would be uh, negative 90, I believe, no, positive 90, uh, So that's 90 degrees. So we could do that. So then I could borrow that angle. I could borrow that angle. Copy. And apply it to all the top of slope. So that's a top of slope. That's a top of slope. This is a top of slope. This is a top of slope. There's no top of slope here. So then I can have all those and I can paste in here. Paste. And paste. Now they have the same rotation angle. So you can start to see some semblance of order. Uh, and same thing here. I've got a 3 to 1 slope here. I've got a 3 to 1 slope here. I'm going to paste it in here. And it all starts to look pretty standard. Oops, maybe I just want to do the other way. So I'm going to list this. And I'll grab that 10 degree mark again. Copy. And tidy this up as well. And I've got a nice look to my drawing. Okay, so that's that's some tips and tricks. So you could play around with the style to get kind of the translation, move the uh, label relative to the marker, and then you can uh, apply a common angle to uh, a bunch of points that have the same rotation angle. So those are some two two tips and tricks that you want to kind of use. And then at a glance, you can kind of see quickly, you know, how, how, how neat and tidy and, and uh, clean that is. So there's just some advice. Uh, that might speed things up. So when you're done all your grading design and you have to rotate and move the points so that they're not, the text doesn't go through the lot line, here's a couple of things you can do to make that happen. Okay. There are many others. Uh, you can have so many different styles to do so many different things. I'm just giving you some basics. Okay? I'm, I'm showing you the possibilities, and I think you, your mind kind of can go ahead and, and look at these things as well. Um, don't get lost in that. 
One of the big pitfalls of using Civil 3D is to spend all your energy dealing with the presentation and the style when really you should be concentrating on the design. Okay, and I know you're, 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 you're doing both roles. You are the designer and you're also the drafts person. You're also making this look good. Um, you know, if, if you have these styles uh, set up and ready to go as part of your template, uh, then you can quickly apply them and get a lot of a lot of drafting done for free. The rotation stuff, not so easy, but certainly the uh, the point label uh, style uh, positioning uh, is is a critical thing. So you may want to look at that as a uh, as a way of doing some mass uh, drafting. You may have to go in and manually change a few things. You know, like this might be confusing, right? What what represents what? So you know, you you might want to rotate this at ninety degrees as well. So it's up to you how you want to do this. This is the existing point. Maybe this wants to be, maybe the design point should be parallel to the lot line at the back. Uh, so we'll ro ro rotate label and marker, and maybe this, whoops, rotate label and marker. And maybe this wants to be parallel here, so it's obvious what's what, okay? The other thing you'll note, and I talked about this yesterday, I'm gonna uh, talk about it again today, uh, is, uh, again, some of the point management. There's two groups so far. You're going to have uh, more than two. Let me just talk about those. So you're going to have two groups. You're going to have FG and you're going to have EG. So these are the groups. You're going to have two groups, FG and EG. Okay. You're also going to have more than one layer. So FG, you've got EG at the back, at the rear. So these are on a layer. These are the layers now. So you have rear, whoops, rear. Uh, layer, the white points at the back. You have front. You also have uh, lot points. Okay, so the layer names for all these are given. But there's a, a layer for the front lot corners. There's a layer for the existing rear. A layer for the existing rear. There's a layer for all your design. I've shown mine in yellow so far. There's going to be another layer for the center line of the road. Uh, center line of the road. Okay. And we don't want to mix the layers for the center line into the FG. So we're going to have to create one more group, right? And this is all in the instructions. Another group is going to be called uh, CL. So one more group called CL for center line. And it's going to have the center line points on it. So I'm going to have proposed elevations in this group on these two layers. I'm going to have existing in this group on this layer. And then I'm going to have the center line design points on uh, a layer for center line. Okay. The style for these two groups are equal. The styles are exactly the same. So if you look at the point on the front lot corner and on your design, they're going to look the same as the center line of the road. The reason we separate them is that when we do our uh, modeling for the surface, your uh, corridor model looks like this. corridor model looks like this. So we're going to have elevations at the street line, right? They're going to be in the FG group and they're going to be on the front layer. Okay. Then we're going to have a point on center. We're going to show the point on center and how to produce that is in your assignment. There's some step-by-step -step instructions. These points, this one, this one, and this one in the plan view are going to look exactly the same. This is on one layer, front. This is on a different layer, called center line. And these are on two different groups. The front lot corners are in the FG group and the center layer is in the CL group. And the style for the marker and the label for these two groups is exactly the same. So they're going to look the same on, uh, in the drawing, but they'll be in two separate groups. Why? When I model the surface, when I do my tint, my triangulated irregular network, I want to model my surface straight across. I don't want it to have this V shape to connect to the point at the center. Okay, I don't want this point on my surface, so I, I can't have it in the FG group. It has to be in a separate layer. It's going to look the same. So these two groups have the exact same settings, but the center line points are in the CL layer and all the design points are in the FG layer. So that when I build my surface, I use the FG group. This is the group I use for my surface and then it'll model straight across. I want it to be flat, okay? We will not model, we will not include the center point, even though we're going to show it in the drawing, 
and we will not model this shape on the finished ground surface at all. Why? I'll explain when we do the final assignment number six. Okay, there's a reason for it. So when we do our finished ground surface, we model straight across, flat, a straight line to straight line. So you have to categorize everything in this way. Okay, so keep that in mind. So there's only, you know, there's three groups. There's going to be an additional group. Two of them is just for the sake of separating, but they look exactly the same. One is separated. They look different, and they're not used for the surface build. Okay, and all that's uh, explained in much more detail in the assignment handout. Any questions so far about that some presentation and some information? lot with the uh, with the appropriate uh, grading type. So I'm going to make a copy of these points. Sorry, of these labels. These are the lot labels. I'm going to make a copy of these. And I'm just going to push them over here. And I'm just going to go uh, 50 meters away. And I'm going to put them on a, a new layer. I'm going to call it grading type. It really doesn't matter where I put them. move them back not exactly on top but close and this is one of the last things you should do because you want to place these so that they're not on top of everything else so i'm going to put them either in front of the lot number or behind somewhere inside and now i want to change what those letters represent so if you remember the first one here this is a front drainer with a three to one and a wall this is a front drainer with a little three to one at the back no wall so this is a front drainer this is a front drainer so then the entire lot is a front drainer This is a front drainer with a little bit of three to one. This is a front drainer, your typical two to three percent side here. So they're both front drainers on both sides. So this is a front drainer. Okay. This side is front. This side is split. You can see your split point here, right? So if you're going from a front on one side and a split on the other, this is your transition line. That's the only time you use that designation. When one side is front and the other side is split. This now is split draining. Simple split on one side, simple split on the other. This is a simple split draining lot, yes. This is a split draining lot. This is a split draining lot. So this is also a split, but you have to be careful. Remember the back split. Let's go back to this uh, exercise. Uh, in the lot grading example. Remember that threshold? So you have to measure this. So if the difference between the front of the house and the back of the house is 1.2 meters or more below, then you're in a back split. If the front elevation versus the back elevation is a difference of less than 1.2, then it's still a simple split draining lot. So you have to measure the, the vertical difference between the front and back. If it's 1.2 or more, we call it a back split. If it's exactly 2.1, it's a walkout. Okay, so let's measure Let's measure these. So the distance, I'm going to turn my O snaps on just to make this go faster. Node. All right, so I know this is a simple split on this side. What's happening on this side? The distance. The difference between the front of the house and the back of the house. Let me just draw the lines for reference. 8 meters to the front, 12 meters to the back of the house. So the vertical difference between here and here is 1.4, which means this side is a back split more than 1.2. This side is a simple split. What am I going to call the lot? Okay. And this is where you have to make a decision. The actual design will be 
finally determined by the architect. So the architect will decide decide whether it turns us into a simple split or a back split. I always go with the deeper condition. So if I have a split and a back split, I would call this a back split. Yes, for back split, sometimes called a duck line. So when you have two, I always go with the deeper condition. Okay, let me measure this one distance from here to here. Right? This is a back split, more than 1.2 below. Measure the distance between here and here. This is exactly 2.1. So this side now is a back split. This side here is a walkout. Again, I always err on the deeper side, so I would call this whole thing a walkout. Okay. Because this side will allow from the basement one step down onto the ground on this side. You might not be able to do it on this side, but you can certainly do it on this side. Okay. And then the rest are all walkouts. So this is a walkout, and this is a walkout. I can measure both sides distance from here to here negative 2.1, and from here to here, negative 2.1, both sides are walkouts, then this is also a walkout. So that's how you label your uh, lot type. Okay? You have to design them all first. Both sides, you have to look at both sides, right? So if both sides are front drainage, then the whole lot is front drainage. If one side is front and the other side is split, we always call it a transition. That's the only funny one. Uh, <coughs> special name. Everything else are split drainage, but to what extent? So again, if you have a simple split and a simple split, it's a split. If you have a split with a back split, we always call it the back split. And if it's a back split with a walkout, I always force the walkout. It really doesn't matter. These labels don't mean anything until the architect decides how they're going to do the uh, architectural uh, uh, layout of the house. Okay? So they're there just as reference. Um, I've argued in the past with companies I've worked for that we, don't, we shouldn't even put them on the drawing because it doesn't matter, but it's something that shows up. So uh, it's an exercise we have to do. I think they still do it on most uh, on most sites. Let me show you a drawing again. A, uh, I'll show you an actual drawing. How are you going to show us what to do with the houses? Yes, and, and that's the last thing I want to discuss today. Uh, and again, and that should be one of the last design things you do. Right? Do as much as you can. You have a front, you have a back, go. Front, back, go. When you're missing the back, do that last. Okay? Do those ones last. But I will show you today. Or I will instruct you on what to do today. Okay? So let me drop it back to you. Uh, so, the, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, the, um, I'm just going to talk about, uh, oh, I wanted to show you a drawing. So here's a, here's a, a subdivision drawing that I've done in the past. Here's a drawing, something I was involved with years ago, so you can see. So this is a grading plan, uh, and you can see uh, there's a, this drawing was about this, uh, this school that was happening in the middle here, but you can see it's surrounded by uh, houses. So if we zoom in here, you'll see on every lot, it's either labeled with a BS, BS, or F, right? This is a front drainer backing onto a back split, front drainer backing onto a back split. Front drainer backing onto a split, front drainer backing onto a split, front to a split, and these labels are all shown. So these are townhouses split draining versus split draining back to back. Um, here are some walkouts backing onto the uh, split drainers. And you can see uh, when there's a three to one slope, they actually put in this sloping information. Right? Uh, you might see, this is faded here because it's a different phase. But you might see this symbol, so you might want to learn how to read these. This is another thing. If you have a walkout, so I'm just gonna, uh, I'm going to draw, let me do it on a different layer. Um, see this layer. Uh, you might see uh, this. So I'm going to go from node to node to node, and then it disappears. So what 
graph shown here is the top of slope and the bottom of slope. Right? And the bottom of slope is at the back of the house. You might see this symbol uh, line here. And if you offset whatever, maybe one meter, you might see this symbol where every other line is shorter. Offset two meters. So you can. So sometimes you'll see this symbol, you'll see these lines, and then you'll see these short lines, and the short lines represent, this is the top of the slope, and this is the bottom of the slope. That's how you read these slope ticks, it's called. Okay? And you might see that in the drawing, and that's what I was just showing you here. So that tells me this is the top of the slope, this is the bottom of the slope. These elevations here are higher than these elevations here. So you can quickly, at a glance, look at your drawing and say, oh yeah, there's the top, there's the bottom of the slope. You can see that here. And every time you have a three to one slope, uh, you can kind of make that out. Uh, let's look at a couple here, right? So here's some back split slopes here through the building. Okay. Uh, there's some more back split slopes here. And it wraps around. We're not going to get into this much detail. I just want you to be aware of this because it's something you're going to see. Here's some more walkouts. And when you look at those symbols, you know, again, the lie of the land. If this is a walkout and this is a split drainer, you know that the elevations of these roads, this road here is higher than the elevation of this road here. Okay. Because you're transitioning from this elevation down to the backyard and then a simple split. So these elevations here are higher than these. And if you look at the front line corners, you'll see that's true. 315.82, 313.2 two meter difference. Where's the two meters? Roughly through the walkout is where you step down. Where they're using the houses here as kind of a retaining wall, um, and so on. So you, you get to see, you get to read them, right, and, and, and understand what the, the symbols mean. This is more complicated than what I'm asking you to do. We're not going to get into this much detail, uh, but certainly the techniques that I'm showing you allow you to do all this kind of work. Okay, so I just wanted, wanted, you, to show, I wanted you to show some of this. So you'll produce most of this, but not all of this. He's teaching you the basics. So, so this this line work, this three to one slope, you don't need to show. Okay, but if you do see it, that's what it represents. Uh, and then if we get into this, I'll show you another one. Um, if you want to do that three to one slope, there's also a three to one slope here. Don't forget from here to here uh, to here, right? So there's another three to one slope here at the back. So if you had this symbol, these symbols here, you could do the same look. And then there's also a three to one here, remember? From here to here, and then it disappears here. And it would look like this. Offset. Uh, just a, a way of reading, right? So then I would cut this in half. This time the top of slope is at the back of the lot. Right? So you know that this, this edge, this blue edge, is higher than this edge here. This is the top of slope, this is the bottom of slope. So that symbology, like I said, uh, is an enhancement that they add to the drawings. Not always, but some to, uh, a lot of times, and it's just easy. The last thing you want to do, and I, I don't know if you've noticed yet, the last thing you want to do is read the numbers. If you can avoid reading the numbers and at a glance kind of have an idea of what's what, what really helps you read the drawing? So if I turn off the points, if I turn off the points and the lot numbers, these symbols tell me which side is higher, and then the name, the lot grading type, also tell me which way it's flowing. I know here, all of this is flowing toward the road. This has a split point somewhere. I know that these, some of the drainage is going to the back, some of it's going to the front. So without looking at the numbers, I can tell based on just this information, which way the ground is falling, and, and how big a difference there is between some sides and the others, okay? So that, that's, that's a quick, reference okay the numbers are important the actual values are important for layout right somebody has to locate the points in, in the in the field and put the proper elevation on it so they can build it the number is, is critical that's the fundamental piece of information but the symbology you show on the drawing at a glance is more useful to you than just the point data okay and then the other thing you can do if you wanted to is look at the contours right remember the Flatter spots have contours further apart. The steeper parts have contours closer together. So that's another way of kind of looking at it. We generally don't show proposed grading contours uh, unless it's an unusual feature. Okay, so let me show you this again. We did this last day. Right, the contours tell the same story. Right, where, what's steep, what's flat, where the slope, the three to one slopes are, and so on. That information is everything you see there. 
is born from the point data. But without the point data, it's a little easier to, to kind of understand what's going on. Okay, so just some background information so that you know. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so this was just a, a little bit of an aside, uh, just to, to show you what, what's actually possible and some of the requirements that you have to kind of go through. The two main things I wanted to, you to walk away with is the rotation on mass for parallel lot lines and the, uh, the marker, the label style adjustment so that you don't have to grip at it on mass. Now, sometimes you may have to manually adjust one or two because there's just so many things, uh, but certainly uh, there, are, there are some efficiencies you can, you can leverage from simple 3D. Any questions about that? Okay, so Sumitra did have a question about those interior rear corners. How do we do that? And uh, I'll give you a brief explanation, and then uh, and then then you've got everything you need. So let me open up my drawing. talking about is how do you deal with this right so I need these interior rear so this is the general rule of thumb first you design the side and then you design the back so what are we looking at here assume this doesn't exist pretend that's not there design this you have a front you have a back design this first and then worry about these particular points after so let's do this I'll just do one very quickly but the order is always the same. The distance, so let's let's look at this. What's the length here? The length here is 34. Go back to here. I'm gonna call this 34. Okay, so now I have all my values. So let's take a look, where are we? Uh, the other thing I wanna establish is I'm gonna offset eight meters. So there's the front of the house. 12 meters, there's the back of the house. And then 7.5, there's the minimum usable backyard. So for this particular lot, going to use these lines. Okay. So front of house, back of house, usable backyard space. Okay. So I have those for reference. I'm going to put them in, in different colors so they're not confusing. Again, nobody sees this. It's just there for reference. I like to use gray. So how am I going to design this? I'm going to measure the distance from the front to the back. Turn off my ortho. And I'm going to look at the Z value. And let me open up my screen a little bit. Try that again. Distance. From the node at the front to the node at the back, you'll see the back is 1.2 lower. The back is 1.2 lower. So let's look at the spreadsheet. 1.2 is right in here. Okay. As a matter of fact, it's between these points. Remember I said you could ignore this? So it's between these two, negative 1.2. So what's my design? I'm going to go up at 2% from the front. I'm going to go up 3% from the back. 2% right? up to the house, 3% up to the house. And then I'm going to do a high low, minus 3, positive 3 to 1. So here's the design. Okay, again, you have to do this on the appropriate layer with the appropriate uh, point group and so on. Okay, I'm going to skip all that. I'm just going to show you the design. So I'm going to go to my points, create points. And I'm going to... This one is just stuck. Hang on a second. Points, create points. So I'm going to use my distance command twice. I'm going to start at the front of the lot, go to the point here for direction, G2, go to here, enter, enter, enter. So that's 2% up. And I'm going to start at the back, from here to the back of the house, G3, position for distance, and there's the elevation at the back of the house. Okay. If I measure the distance vertically between here and here, you'll see it's a simple split. Right? It's less than 1.2. It's lower at the back, but 1.2. It's not 1.2 below. So this would this side would be a simple split. Let's check out the detail. The, the, let's, let's put in the detail of the 3 to 1 slope. So I'm going to put in a high low from here to here, a G of minus 3 down from the front of the house, and an S of positive 3 up from the back. 3 to 1 up. 
and there's the top of slope, right? So this is the back of the house, bottom of slope, top of slope. So now I've designed the side of lot 33. Then what do we do? Well, I know that the slope, I'm going to measure it, inquiry, where's the slope? D for points. The slope from here all the way to the back of the house is 3% which means the slope from here all the way to this corner is also up at 3%. This, this point here, is interpolated between this point and this point. So the simple tool to use is measure your, just double check it, list the point. So the slope from here past that point and beyond to here is up at 3%. So I'm going to use my distance command. And I'm going to go from here to the back of the lot, a grade of 3 now I've interpolated the design elevation at the back of this unit. Same thing here. The slope from here to here is in this direction up at 3%, in this direction down at 3%. Right? Let's measure it. Inquiry, the slope. So from here to here is positive 3. From here to here is negative 3. So just keep track of where you started. I'm going to start from here, from the front of the house. That really doesn't matter. From here to here, a grade of minus 3. So now I've interpolated this value. Okay, I don't need this point for the purpose of lot 33. The slope from here to here is 3%. This is just along the way, interpolated. So now I have an elevation at the front, an elevation at the back, an elevation at the front, an elevation at the back. You know what to do. Okay? Once you know the front and the back, you use this tool to analyze what to do in between. So Matra, does that answer your question? So you design the side first and then interpolate the backyard elevations for the other lots. And then you have a front and back condition that you can use to do the grading of those other lots. And now you have everything you need to know. You can do it assignment four, all the design. There's lots to do. There's a high volume of work to do every lot line. You have to design each one. What's the front? What's the back? What do you do in between? What's the front? What's the back? What do you do in between? You have to design each one, one at a time. And I know it's tedious. So you can see here, right? These angles are all different. You have to rotate those manually one at a time. Some of them are parallel, right? I think if I list this one, that's uh, 829. So this is 829. This is 829. No, that's different. 829. So these two are parallel. So this is parallel, 829. And this is parallel, 829. No, these two. These two are parallel. So I can rotate these together. Right? 829. So whatever rotation <coughs> I use for this one, I can apply it to all of these and everything in between and so on. Okay. So it's not always positive. These are all parallel. So if you list this one, 2712, this one, 2712. So all of these are parallel. You can use a common rotation angle and so on. So you got to find those patterns and then and do everything appropriate. Okay. In here, again, don't get lost in this. I'm going to trim this off. Lot 34. Lot 34, you design the side. That's a good question. Lot 34, you design. There's a, lot 34 only has one side. This edge is the road. We don't design the road. The road is going to be parallel to the center line. So just do that and that and nothing in between. So when you have what's called a flank, a flank lot, let me type that in, flank. Oops, flank. Flank lot. So that's what we call a flank lot. Okay, so flanks the road. So the edge next to the road, you don't do anything. So lot 34 only has one side. Uh, lot 1. Lot 1 only has one side, interior. This is the road, the other road, so don't do anything here. Uh, inside here, lot 6, this is a flank lot, so don't do anything between these two points. Just design this side. That's a good question. Thanks, Mitra, for bringing that up. Uh, yeah. You do have to design this, however. Uh, is it a must to copy-paste the degree? No, I'm just giving you some hints. Do whatever you want. Uh, lot 36, uh, on the side here, this, between here and here, this is not a road, so you do have to design that. Same thing at the end of the subdivision. Let me get rid of these for a moment. 
You have to design this between here and here, and you have to design this between here and here. This on the side here is not a road, so you do have to design the end of the site. Uh, some students miss that every time, so be careful. Okay, and look at the offsets. They get kind of wonky. Here's one problem you're going to run into. Okay, these offsets are true. These are what the zoning requires, an offset from the front. Okay, uh, don't get lost in here. Let me just trim this. I'm going to trim between uh, here and here, this corner condition. So I'm going to trim here and here. This stuff here doesn't make any sense. Okay, so these are the setbacks for lot seven, and then you can extend these because they're parallel. These are the setbacks for lots four, five, and six. Okay, remember you're not designing this, so you don't need to go all the way there. And you're not designing this, right? So when the side is a road, don't do anything. Um, so if you list this, if you list this, let's say I was designing this one, and it comes up as 39.9, I can go to my spreadsheet and type in 39.9, 9, nine I think it was 9.1, sorry. 917. Okay, and it does all the math. Now, this assumes that the lot line is perpendicular to the street line, which may not be the case. So if we're looking at lot 8, again, this one, right, 39191, by analyzing this, the distance, the distance from the end point to the intersection may or may not be exactly 8. Look at this one. End point intersection. This distance is actually a little bigger than 8. It's close, but it's going to be off a little bit. So if this is not perpendicular to the street line, then all of these numbers, 8, 12, and 7.5, aren't going to be exact. Now, if you want to, you can type in the actual numbers based on your setback. You can go and measure along the lot line, right? Measure along the lot line, this length, measure the lot of the distance between the front and back of house. Okay, remember, the offset Length from here to here, this is 12 meters. This is going to be a little bit longer. And again, the distance from here to here, this is the 7.5. This is going to be a little bit longer, and so on. If you want to go and type in, adjust the 8, the 12, and the 7.5, adjust the 8, the 12, and 7.5, you can. It's a lot more work. But they'll be so close that this will still be enough to guide you through what's going to happen. If it doesn't work, it's because these are significantly different. And where you're going to find that kind of problem is in here. See here? Distance from the end point to the intersection. This is the lot. You're designing along the lot line, but this distance is now 8.3. And this distance is now 13. And this distance is now almost 10 meters instead of 7.5. But those are the, these are the markers. You need to design to this intersection to this intersection and to this intersection. Okay? These offsets are true. Those are the areas where the usable backyard in the house is going to be, where your front yard is. It's parallel to the front. The lot lines may not be perpendicular, and it's going to cause you problems. So what's happened in the past with some students is they type in this number, 37171, into the spreadsheet. And then they do the math. Here, right? They check the distance between the front and back, which I don't have on this one, but they check the distance between the front and back, and then they look it up at the back here. And then they say, oh, I'm actually between uh, these two numbers. But in fact, uh, these numbers may be off if you don't adjust these. If these are significantly different, then these are going to be significantly different. So when you think you have a solution and it doesn't work out, you try and do it. You try and input your solution and it doesn't work out the way you expect it, it's because these are significantly different. So you may have to then change these and adjust these numbers and see where you're actually at. It'll be close though, right? If you think you've got a front drainer with a little bit of slope, it might be all slope, right? It's, gonna, it's not going to be that far off, right? These numbers, even if you change them, you know, if you make this 10 meters, these aren't going to change by too much. Okay, so... Uh, just be mindful of that. Okay, that's something that causes some problems. Okay, again, what I did was kind of sterile condition, right? I tried to show you exactly how this thing works, but in reality, you know, some of these uh, dimensions are not going to be exactly what's on the spreadsheet. And you know, if you want to type in the exact numbers all the time, that's fine, right? But again, like I like I suggested, uh, as you do the lot grading, you know, after you've done the entire site lot grading, you're gonna you're gonna rely on uh, going to rely on this less and less. 
I, I feel like I don't even use this anymore. I just do a lot of crazy stuff. Um, and it doesn't take long to get to that point. My first project when I graduated was a, um, a 1,200, 1,200 lot subdivision. And I was doing all the lot grading. So after my first project, I was almost an expert. You know, the more of this you do, the more you know, the more you kind of realize. So when you do that many, and there's only eight possibilities of what might happen in Richmond Hill, um, you'll find that you know which which of these eight solutions am I going to apply? You encounter probably all of them uh, a few times when you're doing 1,200 lots. And that's going to be the testing ground. And like I said, when you graduate from Seneca, you'll have done 36 lots on this uh, particular uh, in this particular course. Next semester, there's about well, there's more than 60 or 70 to do. Okay, uh, so that's where we're headed. That's why you, you really need to. Uh, there's no shortcuts. Like you have to do the whole thing. Why? Because I want the proposed ground for the entire subdivision. I want the surface for the proposed ground for the entire subdivision so that I can compare it to the existing ground and come up with a volume of cut fill, volume of earthworks. That's where we're headed for assignment six. Okay, and that's all I wanted to discuss today as far as uh, the last bit of information you need. Some of it drafting, uh, a little more detail on the design of the interior rear lots. Uh, any questions? Any other questions? Remember at the end of the day, either freeze or delete your setback ones. Nobody needs to see those. Although, uh, you may have seen, uh, sometimes they show the building up, which includes <coughs> setback and side setbacks. Right? So, some subdivisions show, let's say it was 8 meters to the front, uh, 12 meters to the back of the house, and it could be 1.2 for the side and 0.6 on the other side. And then if you put in a boundary here, sometimes they want to see the building envelope. They want to see the extent of the building. The house has to be inside there. It can't be too far forward. It can't be too far back. You have to stay away from the sides. You might have to show what these are called the building envelopes. I'm not asking you to do that, but you, know, you might see that on some drawings. As a matter of fact, I think the drawing I showed you, let's see if I can find it here, the drawing I showed you earlier does have the building envelopes. See this dashed line? This dashed line here, that's the building envelope. Actually, there's a setback to the main building, and then there's a setback to the garage. The garage could be a little further. Again, it depends on the subdivision zoning bylaws, but you can see the building envelopes. And there might be some better ones here. Uh, this one's not showing it, but certainly parts parts of it show building envelope. So sometimes it's required, sometimes it's not. You don't have to do that. I'm just showing it to you as, a, as an example. Uh, as I said, I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah, this is due November 20th. November 20th. Friday, November 20th. Instead of two weeks, you actually have three weeks. I don't think you need the extra week, but I know in the past a lot of students have uh, said that they needed more time. This is the most time consuming assignment, so an extra week I think is warranted. Then we're going to go back to two weeks for the pipes. So we're going to do the pipe. Uh, input, not the design. I'm going to give you the design. So I'm going to give you all the sizes and slopes. Then you just have to draw them using Civil 3D. That's two weeks. And then the earthworks uh, is just follow a process. There's some step-by-step -step instructions for assignment six, which is uh, very straightforward. So that, that's there's only a week to do that one. But that's kind of sit down, take the hour or two to do it, and you're done. Okay, so it won't take long. And it doesn't take long to teach you. So I always like leaving that one till the end. We could do the earthworks calculation after assignment four, but I like to leave it till the end because it's pretty, pretty quick. Okay, that's it for today. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, like I said, I sent out the detailed marking rubric. If you're not sure what corrections you need to make, uh, I can discuss that with you. 
Uh, I know a few of you have sent me emails. I haven't gotten back to you yet, but I will. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna as, as soon as we're done here, I'm gonna email uh, those of you who contacted me, and I'll set up some appointments, uh, probably for tomorrow morning, if you're available. Like uh, after nine, I have a meeting at ten thirty. So before ten thirty tomorrow is when I'm gonna try and schedule those meetings. Uh, so you should get an email back shortly. I'm gonna check my email right now. Okay. Again, I strongly recommend, I can't force you to do anything, but I strongly recommend you do this homework assignment. Okay, and I've also posted uh, the solution for this. Um, so there is a solution for um, the actual uh, answers. I'll show you. There's a PDF. I, actually, I just posted it this morning. I realized that I forgot to add it. Uh, there is this document. Um, so there's a PDF with the final elevations that you're looking for with all the slope references. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, whoops, where is it? Um, share application. So I did post this. So this has all the solutions with some, some of the details, right? So the offset is eight meters, 12 meters, 7.5. I've drawn the reference line, those dashed gray lines. And I've shown all the slope. When you look at this, this is the other thing that's kind of uh, funny to see. So this is the final answers you should get, right? I've given you, I gave you the front, I gave you the existing rear. What do you design in between? Okay. Um, so the solution is here. So if you can go through the exercise and produce the same information that you see here, then those tools are, are pretty uh, are pretty tight. You, can, you should be able to do that. Um, what's interesting is when you look at the grading plan, you can check it. You can quickly see. You know how this design adheres to the standard, right? So you can see the like if you were marking this, if you were looking at this, you can see that everything is correct. How you actually create it, there's no book for it. Okay, I'm just giving this to you from my experience. What do you do first? What do you do next? Right? If you remember what happens here, right? Like for the walkout, we went from the front up at two percent. That's how you get the front corner. Then I take that number, I put it to the back of the building, I push it down 2.1. Then that, once I have the front and back of the building, I use the high-low command to get this elevation. And then in the backyard here, I went down 3% using the distance command, down 3 to 1 to get the elevation to the back. Okay. So when you see everything, I don't put in the front and then the next one and then the next one and the next one and the next one. Right? The order of operation is something you kind of have to figure out. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I illustrated it uh, quite a bit uh, last day. Um, but when you see the final thing, you can't tell what was done first and what was done next and so on. You kind of have to watch the video from yesterday and, and, and listen to the instruction and figure out what comes first and what goes next and so on. Okay, so you can check, do the homework exercise, and then your final answer is here. So if you can produce this based on the instructions from yesterday, you've got all the tools you need to do the lot grade. Sorry, there were some questions. Uh, is there any more than two points? If there are more than two points at the back of the lot, does it require an interpolated point? Uh, you mean between lot lines, Brian? Uh, I think you're talking about this. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I think you mean... So suppose... Let me do this. Oops. If your subdivision looks like this, if there's a point out here, is this what you're talking about, Brian? Yeah, so if that's there, all you need to do is put an existing ground point there, elevation from surface, and you don't have to design anything. Just design this and design this. Leave that alone. There's nothing to design. Okay? Uh, it may require some design, but I'm not going to get into that detail. If you wanted to, you could draw a line from the center to the end point and design the grading there, but we, typically we don't do that. We just design the two sides, and this will take care of itself later. The reason this is required okay, is because when you do your surface, you want to triangulate uh, from here to here, and you want this triangle included. You want this triangle on your surface. If you don't put a point there, then it'll, the edge of your surface will go from here to here, and then this area will be missed in the volume calculation, which is going to give you an error. Okay? So even though this is existing, you still have to propose a point there. You don't have to design it. Just propose a point that's equal. Okay? 
So make sure there's an FG point there. So the existing must be shown. And remember, you always show two elevations at the back, right? Let's go back to the grading example. No matter what the existing elevation is at the back, you always show a proposed point at the back. Right? If it's the same elevation, we still show proposed at the back. If it's a different elevation, that indicates a wall. So always have an FG point at the back. Because okay, those are the points that are going to build your surface. Sorry, Trent. Uh, how do you label the slope? Uh, which slope? I'm talking about uh, this stuff here, between uh, this white stuff, Trump? You're talking about the 2% and the 3%, what I've got on here? You're talking about these? 2%, 3%? That's for another day. <laughs> you don't need to do that. I'm going to show you that next year. Baby steps. Yeah, that's my hook. That's how I get you back to school after Christmas. If you want to learn how to do that, I'll show you next year. Uh, where I will show it. I, I'm not going to ask you to do it. Uh, it's more work, but I will show you how to do it. It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's almost a magic trick. What you see is not exactly what you think. But it is a civil 3D label. I'll give you that much. Trump, next semester, ask me again when we do our grading. I promise I'll answer that question. But right now, it's just it's more than more than we need. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I've got about a half hour. If anybody wants to uh, schedule a meeting in the next half hour, I think I had a couple. Um, let me check my email. There was a couple of you that did uh, did want to meet. Let me just see here. You're welcome, Carl. Let me just check. So, uh, T, do you want to meet now?